Robinson. I'm a senior researcher with the Mobile Robotics Group at the University of Oxford, and I'm the technical lead on our autonomous uh, robot car project, which is a, a Nissan LEAF vehicle that we modified to drive autonomously on urban streets. Uh, I'm also involved with our uh, LUTS Pathfinder and UK Auto Drive project, which is a, a project to deploy these small driverless two-person vehicles to Milton Keynes within the next couple of years. Uh, so today, hopefully, I can convince you that the development of a fully autonomous car that, that doesn't even need a driver is actually a robotics problem and a software problem. Um, so I'm going to give a, an overview of the robotics technology that powers our vehicles and hopefully autonomous cars in the future. And I also want to list some of the challenges that we need to meet before we have widespread adoption of autonomous cars in the real world. So hopefully, as a researcher, I can afford to be a little bit more speculative about the future of autonomous driving, and hopefully we can uh, provoke some interesting discussion at the end of the session. So why are robots interesting? So fundamentally, robots move stuff. So the last 30 years, we've seen that the internet has transformed how computers move information around, and robotics is now transforming how computers move things around. And this means that the potential applications of robotics are in the industries that already, at the moment, are moving things, so automotive and logistics, uh, where robotics has the potential to uh, drastically increase safety and efficiency. Um, so automotive, obviously, I'll be focusing on today. Uh, but interestingly, logistics is actually a larger worldwide market and is already adopting robotics in many, uh, many applications. So, Specifically for mobile robots, so not your factory robot arms, but robots that actually drive around and perform tasks, uh, the most success has been had in jobs that people don't want to do, so jobs that are dirty, dull, and dangerous. So in Australia, where I'm from, uh, most of our economy depends on moving stuff, mostly digging it out of the ground and selling it to other people. So uh, in the last couple of years, most of the big mining companies in Australia have adopted driverless haul truck technology uh, and many other types of mining automation, which has significantly increased mine safety and also has uh, led to billions of dollars of cost savings um, within the mining community due to increased efficiency. Uh, robotics is also being applied to the shipping and port industries with autonomous straddle carriers. Robots can also do things that people can't do at all. Um, so if any of you are scuba diving enthusiasts, you could imagine how unpleasant it would be to go scuba diving at 1,600 meters. Um, and that's what this robot is essentially doing at the moment. So this is footage from uh, one of the robots that was performing repairs after the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and also, uh, recently, in response to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, DARPA, the uh, American defense uh, research arm, uh, created a competition to develop robots that could enter a disaster zone, use hand tools, drive vehicles that people might drive, and perform all the actions that a disaster first response uh, person might do, but in, in a nuclear radiation zone where no person can safely enter. So how does a robot work? What, how does a robot know where to go and what to do? Uh, so, I'm going to talk about, in the next few slides, the core technology behind mobile robots. Uh, and it's divided into two broad areas. The first is the where. So where am I now? Where am I trying to get to? How do I get there? Uh, the second is the what, which is what's around me right now? What do I have to interact with? Uh, and what do I do? What actions do I take to get me to my destination or to perform whatever task I'm trying to do? So. Interestingly, uh, as we heard before about uh, autonomous driving and longitudinal and lateral control, for autonomous cars, the robot really only needs to know two numbers, which is the, the speed of the vehicle and the steering angle of the vehicle. So all of this sensor processing, uh, machine learning, everything just boils down to two numbers that the car needs to know at any one period of time, which makes it sound like possibly a simple problem. So the first part of mapping is, sorry, the first part of the where problem is mapping. So building a map of the environment that the robot needs to operate in so that it knows where to go to do certain tasks. So generally for autonomous driving, we want our cars to drive with maybe centimeter level precision. So the maps need to be built to centimeter level precision to enable this. 
So here we have a video of our mobile mapping system at the top, which is attached to the back of a vehicle. You can just drive it around and build a very detailed three-dimensional map of the environment that you've been through. Uh, down the bottom is a video from Nokia's 3D mapping division, um, which can build 3D city scale maps to centimeter precision. So this company was actually recently bought by uh, Audi, BMW, and Daimler for two and a half billion euros, uh, which indicates how important these automotive, big automotive companies uh, think mapping is going to be for the future of their industry. The next challenge, once you have a map, is localization. So where am I right now? Um, so typically, you use the sensors that are on board the vehicle, camera sensors, uh, LiDAR sensors, and GPS, and a combination of these three uh, to work out where you are to within a few centimeters. So again, at the top, we've got our uh, localization system running on our autonomous Nissan LEAF vehicle. This is the visualization. Um, so it's using cameras around the vehicle and figuring out where it is within a 3D model of its environment. Uh, down the bottom, we have a video from Google uh, showing how they localize along a highway using a spinning LiDAR scanner mounted to the roof of the vehicle. So the challenges with localization is it has to work regardless of the conditions. So it needs to deal with uh, weather, lighting changes, uh, dynamic objects. So if a bus drives up in front of you, you still need to know where you are. Uh, and also other effects such as slow seasonal change and other changes in the environment. <coughs> so that's the where part. The second part is what. So what's around me and what's it going to do? So generally this is about detecting other vehicles in the environment or pedestrians or cyclists. Um, using your onboard sensors. So again, cameras, LiDAR scanners, and also radar is useful for this. Um, and detecting what's around you and then working out what it is. So at the top, we've got a video from our uh, LiDAR-based um, lo uh, perception system. So this is a bunch of people all walking around the vehicle. And you can see that it is detecting where they are and tracking them. And it can, it can also predict the motion of the people. So it can say, where's this person going to be in five seconds? Are they going to be walking in front of the vehicle or in the other direction? Um, at the bottom is a recent video from NVIDIA. So they are investing heavily in deep learning technology. So from a database of millions and millions of images where people have gone and labeled particular vehicles, they can then learn what vehicles look like under different conditions and recognize them in a live vehicle footage. So this is useful because you can see it can pick up a police vehicle specifically. So it knows that when it's driving, it needs to react to a police car differently than it reacts to a regular car. Um, and <laughs> the challenge with perception is coping with the unexpected. So if you come across something that isn't in your database of things, let's say you came across this car on the road, you, you've never seen it before, what do you do? And the final part of the what is planning. So what actions do I take to get me to my goal? So this takes in everything so far. It takes in the map, your desired destination. It takes in your current position from localization. And it takes in uh, what's around you. And then it generates from that uh, a set of actions or a feasible path um, for the vehicle. So you, at the top, we've got footage from the Daimler autonomous prototype vehicle. So it's uh, planning a path along the road in a very narrow urban environment. And down the bottom, you can see uh, another video from Google showing how its planner can cope with the presence of dynamic objects like cyclists, uh, other road users, and generate the, the green line, which is the path that the vehicle is trying to follow through the environment. So you can see that uh, in front of the car, the green line moves around depending on where other road users are and where they're likely to go. Um, the challenge of planning is coping with uncertainty. So nothing is 100% accurate or 100% precise. There's always some uncertainty on your, your map, your localization. Uh, maybe you've detected a person in front of you, but maybe it's actually a picture of a person on a billboard. Um, how do you cope with uh, this kind of uncertainty? Um, and the output of the planner is the two numbers that I talked about before, the desired speed and the desired steering angle. So. This sounds really good. It sounds like we have the four components uh, all working, and we have everything we need for autonomous driving. Obviously, there's still a little bit of work to be done uh, coping with you know, all sorts of conditions, uh, which is great for me. Otherwise, I'd be out of a job. So uh, how do we go from the technology, the theory, 
to implementing it in practice. So Carl mentioned before there were various levels of autonomy. So uh, the US Highway Agency has proposed a series of levels of uh, autonomous vehicle. Um, so ranging from at the very top, uh, the domain of your classic car and sports car enthusiast, a car that has no autonomy whatsoever uh, and possibly even no electronics, uh, all the way through uh, various more advanced driver assistance systems until you get to something like Google's prototype vehicle, which initially uh, was built without a steering wheel or pedals. Um, so it can drive with no occupant inside. Uh, interestingly, if your car has an anti-lock braking system, you could argue that it's actually a level two autonomous vehicle because if you slam on the brakes, your car says, I see what you're trying to do, but you're going about it all wrong. Um, let me take over. So it actually um, does something different to what the driver is commanding uh, in order to improve, uh, improve safety. So a lot of car manufacturers are following this like a, you know, a list to um, implement features one by one, and it's good for manufacturers because you can develop a technology, you can test it thoroughly, you can then use it, then you can develop the next technology that works well with that one, you can test it independently, and so on. Um, but there is a bit of an elephant in the room here, and that is level three. So what does it mean to have a vehicle that is both fully autonomous but reverts control to the driver in an emergency? Um, I'll come back to this point in a minute, but first I want to talk about another issue facing widespread autonomous vehicle development, which is software. So with autonomous cars, we have most of the technology we need. We have the sensors, um, cameras, LiDAR scanners, radars. Some of them are a bit expensive at the moment, but they will come down in price eventually. Uh, we also have the actuators. So most cars today have a CAN bus, um, and with a lot of the vehicles, you can actually um, control the ECU, you control the steering wheel, the power steering, directly over the, the uh, CAN bus. So the so-called drive-by wire. You could have an autonomy system that could take control, um, obviously with some interaction, uh, but could drive the car by itself. Uh, the problem is what goes in between those two things, which is code. So here we've got a couple of extremely impressive uh, vehicles uh, that are capable of incredible feats that run on millions of lines of mission-critical software. Um, these systems actually pale in comparison to the modern automobile, which has hundreds and hundreds of microcontrollers distributed all around the car, all communicating with each other, each one running tens of thousands and up to millions of lines of code. Um, so even in production cars today, they have possibly multiple tens of millions of lines of code. Autonomous cars of the future, obviously they need to deal with a whole lot more um, in terms of the sensing requirements and the intelligence, so they'll need correspondingly more code uh, to deal with them. So in some respects, it's actually not surprising to see that software companies like Google are the ones leading the charge in developing autonomous vehicles. Uh, because these kind of companies have a lot of experience with managing big, complex software projects. The problem with increased uh, complexity comes uh, problems with reliability. So the more complex a system is, the more chances are there'll be some kind of failure case that you hasn't shown up in testing. And for a big software company, generally the consequences of this are your website goes down for a few hours. But for an autonomous vehicle, the consequences can be a lot more severe. Um, and there is actually already an industry that is both very highly autonomous and regularly transports people uh, in autonomous vehicles every day. Um, and there are many lessons we can learn from that. And that's the commercial aircraft industry. So pretty much all modern airliners are capable of flying the entire flight from takeoff, cruise, landing, and taxiing entirely without any pilot input. The autopilot systems are sufficiently advanced that they can basically take control of the whole flight. Uh, in practice, uh, the pilots handle the takeoff and landing manually most of the time, or well, almost all of the time, but most of the cruise time is spent uh, on autopilot. These planes use something called an, an inertial reference unit to basically do localization for it. They tell where the plane is and how it's flying. And these are so important that every plane has at least three of them on board and they all communicate with each other and make sure they all agree on the same answer. 
but there was a particular flight, Qantas Flight 72 in 2008, where a, spirit, a series of very uh, specific events caused a particular problem between the, the, with the interaction between these three reference units, and it caused an oscillation which meant that at some point, two of them agreed on the wrong answer, which meant that the plane thought that it was about to go into a stall. Uh, the autopilot then commanded a very uh, sudden pitch down maneuver, which caused the plane to go into a negative 0.8 G dive. So luckily, no one died, but there were many serious injuries from people essentially falling upwards into the roof of the plane. And you can see the kind of damage that was sustained. So this particular software fault was not found in 128 billion operational hours. So that's almost 15,000 years worth of testing. Um, but it's the result of a complex interaction between uh, complex systems in a life, well, a mission critical and a, a safety critical situation. So automakers of the future need to be very adept at managing the complexity of the software for their autonomous systems. Uh, to avoid things like this. And there's another lesson that we can learn from the aircraft industry, which is the interaction between the driver and the autonomous prototype, uh, autonomous software. So let's say, hypothetically, you, have, uh, you live one, a half an hour away from work, so it means that you have an hour commute every day. And one day you, drive, you buy the latest and greatest autonomous car, well, semi-autonomous car, level three, that uh, provides 99% autonomy. So it can take over 99% of the driving for you. So uh, instead of driving for an hour every day, you're now driving for an average of 18 seconds every day. So over time, inevitably, you will get worse at driving because you're not practicing it for hours every day uh, to make sure that you maintain the skills. Um, furthermore, the 1% of the time that you are driving is the time that the car is not comfortable with driving or it's reverting to you in an emergency. So you're being asked to take over all of a sudden in an emergency situation, even though you're getting less and less practice at the regular act of driving. So you have to sit there constantly on alert, ready to take over in an emergency. Um, so something very similar to this happened with Air France Flight 447, where the pitot tubes that measure the airspeed iced over and caused the autopilot to uh, register a fault, but it didn't know what the fault was, so it returned control to the pilots. Uh, and in this sudden emergency situation, one of the pilots did the wrong thing and caused the plane to come uh, to uh, stall, and it was irrecoverable, and the plane crashed in the ocean. So these kind of scenarios um, have led Google and other, um, I guess, robotic car manufacturers, so Ryan Eustace, who's running the development of the Ford uh, autonomous prototype, um, to come out and say that there should be no such thing as a semi-autonomous car or a 99% autonomous car, because uh, in a situation, an emergency situation, you really can't rely on having the driver take over. And uh, I guess the, the reaction times that you need are far too great. Um, so it's sort of autonomy or bust for them. It's either 100% or it's highly automated but not autonomous. Essentially, a fully autonomous car must be a robot. Um, so, despite all this doom and gloom, uh, I don't want to seem pessimistic. In fact, I'm optimistic about the future of autonomous vehicles and fully autonomous vehicles, but they may not take the form that you're expecting. Uh, so, Google's latest prototype vehicle is a small two-person car. It drives at low speed around urban environments. Um, and we're also working with Transport Catapult, obviously, on the Lutz project, which is a small two-person vehicle that doesn't drive on regular roads and highways. It drives on sort of shared urban spaces. And um, it means that you don't have to develop all the technology before you set the car free. Um, you can be incrementally working on it in a more safe environment where the risks of you know, reverting to the driver in an emergency are much lower. Um, as Carl mentioned, uh, the, it's very likely that in the next couple of years we'll have highly automated driving on highways. So I think Tesla this morning announced that they were rolling out the software update to say that uh, that will enable um, a autopilot on highways for all their vehicles. Um, and I guess more progress in that respect, but you still have to be cautious about how much automation and how much of the driving can the car take over before it becomes unreasonable to expect the human to do the other half. 
um, on the topic of uh, autonomy being a software problem. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if the next big automakers were in fact software companies, so Google, Apple, Tesla, and Uber? Um, and finally, uh, if in the future we have vehicles like this where we can just pull them up and they'll take us from one place to another, do we need to own our own vehicles which spend most of their time sitting uh, in the garage? If you can just call up a robot to do the driving for you. So that's all I have to say, so I'll take questions at the end.